If you've got a question, the voices of resin are here. Ooh, last chicks. Last chicks is an SPE sponsored podcast. Hey, girl. Hey. Hey. How are you? You look so nice in your little. What's that? Lilac? I'm sure I'm saying the wrong color. Lilac. Well, I, I mean, actually, I'm wearing my um, Influx T-shirt today underneath. Um, Lindsay and I were recently at, uh, at an event we, we hosted the Q&A for, but that's a different story and a different okay. podcast episode <laughs> that we have yet to do. Um, so I am Mercedes Landazzari. And I am Lindsay Nebel. And with our powers combined, we are Plastics, <laughs> the voices of resin. That's us. <laughs> Um, so uh, you can listen to our podcast uh, about all things plastic uh, the first Friday of every month. You can uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And that's Plastics. Um, oh, I. People, yeah, no, I, a lot of people do call us Plastichics and we're fine with that. But if you're searching, just P-L-A-S-T-C-H-I-C-K-S. We should steal the name Plastichics too. So that way we just can have case. everything diverted to us. Totally. That would, be, that would be the smart way to do it, but I don't think we're going to do that. Um, feels yeah. like a lot of extra work. It does um, feel like, and, and probably we shouldn't do like a strategy call, like while we have these two guests who are waiting to be introduced. Either. It, it's probably a good call. And not to mention, we wouldn't actually do the work. We would, we would pass we, the buck as we, we wouldn't do a strategy work. call unless it yeah. was just a two minute thing right before a big launch or something. Procrastination is key. Our stuff. Um, and also don't forget, you can watch us on uh, SP's YouTube channel as well for the live version where you can see us um, get flustered and hesitate. Much like right now. And and hey, if you don't know where to listen to podcasts, you can just go uh, to 4SPE.org slash podcast and listen to them right on your web browser there. Yes. Um, and so now that we've strategized and introduced ourselves, um, we are going to bring in our guest today, which I'm super excited about because um, if, you know, those of you who don't know, I am in Erie, PA, and I have a love for this little city. Um, it's like the little underdog. Um, and these two guests are, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but there is going to be a facility here in Erie that I'm really jazzed about. Um, and I'm excited to talk to them about it. So today um, we have Chris and Mitch um, from IRG. If you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves, um, get a little background. Sure. Hi, it's hey. great to meet you guys. Um, my name is Mitch Hecht and I'm a newcomer to Erie and I'm loving Erie. Got uh, got to the city in November and incredibly excited about my new newly adopted hometown. <laughs> And of course, the weather is great now. When I came in November, it was pretty cold. November, so I did. Yeah. I survived. I survived the eerie, eerie winter. Um, but so yeah, so I, I've I've been working um, on this what I call the longest uh, running startup in in uh, probably in American history. But um, it's very all encompassing and it's uh, very visionary. And so yeah, our our plan is to build what we hope will ultimately be the largest or mega sized um, recycling plant in the country, maybe ultimately the world. And uh, yet we have very ambitious goals and that is to completely revolutionize plastic recycling and kind of fix what we think is the broke system. And we think we have the way to do that. And I've been working on it, as I say, a long time. And I got to know this guy who's in the tile underneath me um, about five or six years ago when he was <clears throat> running a large uh, plastic recycling plant in the wow. UK. And we always thought we wanted to work together. So we eventually uh, got the chance to do that. So I'll let Chris introduce himself. Found, found our way to beautiful Erie PA. And uh, I've been there. I've been in Erie since March. So I missed most of the winter. Obviously, you can tell from my accent, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, but uh, loving, loving Erie, uh, loving the weather, and uh, and really enjoying being there, and very excited about our project. So, my background is uh, I'm, as I say, born and bred in Melbourne, Australia. Had ten years in the UK, built um, uh, what was then the first food grade uh, plastics plant uh, in the UK to do both high density polyethylene milk jugs and PET, which are basically uh, your water and fizzy soda drinks. And uh, so we did uh, started off 35,000 tons and grew it to about 60,000 tons. And that material was sold back to the dairies and, uh, and to um, 
some of the big brands. So uh, very exciting project. Went back to Australia for a couple of years. Got a call from Mitch. He said, I think we're on. You're coming to Derry. I said, can't wait. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, got on a plane and we've, uh, we've been um, pushing the project hard ever since I've been there. So uh, really enjoying it. Great, great. So I remember I first heard about your company um, uh, when Lindsay got very, Lindsay and I will always um, text each other about things, you know, um, issues important in the plastics and not important. <laughs> Um, issues in the plastics industry, or especially when there's negative press in the plastics industry. Um, and, uh, I think it was, it was about this, you know, when, when, um, there was some kind of very, you know, a, a smaller publication had, had maybe, or maybe there were comments on an article. It was a smaller publication. It, and it seems so counterintuitive. I know we talked about this in, in recent episodes of the podcast too, where people said, no, we don't want, you know, this company to bring plastics recycling to Erie, which is just so is so um so wrong right <laughs> it's like how do you solve the the problem of plastics waste without recycling but um uh and so we we both you know went off on a on a a pretty big rant on that together uh in in your favor in irg's favor but um but can you tell us what uh what makes irg different from traditional recyclers sure well i could um i'll try to kick that one off and then chris you can kind of yeah. throw in a few cents and i appreciate Appreciate your comments and support. I mean, we don't take it the wrong way. We actually think that a lot of people are skeptical about recycling today in general. And I think, um, you know, rightly so, they have a lot of reason to be skeptical that that recycling is not work, working. And we actually agree with that. And so when we kind of come and we're kind of got this new idea, you know, we face a lot of um, obvious, a lot of skepticism from people who really don't understand either what exactly what we're doing or what we're trying to do or what we're going to be different than than any of a number of other attempts at recycling. So just kind of very basically, we are creating a sorting machine that we we're not recyclers in the truest sense that we don't do anything like we're not advanced recyclers. We don't take the material and turn it back into products. We don't, we're not that kind of downstream. We think the problem really with recycling today is is upstream, and that's at the collect that's the collection point. So, at the point of collection and the and the point of how you sort the materials, which today are all sorted manually. You know, the 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 pressure is on the the homeowner, the resident, the consumer to sort out what's good and bad plastic. Essentially, we want to, we want to reverse that, and what we say is we need an industrial scale, very high speed totally automated way of sorting the different types of plastic <clears throat> into what's today recyclable, what's not recyclable. And then ultimately, if you have a home, if you can create a home for everything that comes in the door unsorted, you know, that's really what can drive really industrial scale, really increase the recovery of recyclable materials because it really changes the economics um, of the business from what we um, traditionally see. And what's really cool is that I think just in the past, you know, we'll say five years, we are really, technologies are emerging that we really will have a home for everything that <clears throat> comes in the door. So we don't, we don't really have to sort anything. You know, people in the home shouldn't have to sort anything anymore. There is really no, there will be no recyclable, non-recyclable plastics in five to 10 years. It's funny and, you say that, you know, putting the onus on you know not the homeowner because uh even my husband i've caught him putting like bags or like film in and i'm like mm. no like, you can't do not in our house other people's house fine but our house you at least have to know better it's good that you do bin audits i do them on a regular <laughs> basis <laughs> uh, right, you kick it off you, yeah, you no, 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 look i think um i think uh, yeah mitch's point is 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 completely correct the issue has been there's just been a lack of infrastructure. And the, what's driven that has been basically the export market. So for years, we were doing cursory sorts in our material and merts, and we were just shipping it over to China or, you know, parts of Asia. And, uh, you know, then relying on them to separate out the different polymers. And then they just landfilled the rest. And, uh, you know, we're all getting away with that. It was, it was crazy. I, I'd, I'd spent a good 15 years of my life campaigning that that was a completely unsustainable structure. 
and uh, and that in fact effectively what we were doing is in a ton of uh, of plastic bale we were shipping 30 or 40 percent that was uh, landfill and uh, and no one seemed to care it was like this sort of conspiracy of silence so then when of course the national sword kicked in in China that that put a laser focus on the recycling industry because all of a sudden the the people that owned the infrastructure couldn't get away with the poor sorting and that is exactly what we are trying to fix the the key to this is being able to get homogeneous um different polymers the ones twos threes and the color and separating colors and fours five sixes and that type of thing and giving them to a, a downstream recycler that actually has the ability to convert them back into a product that that goes genuinely back into the marketplace and so that i think that's why I think this is the beginning of real recycling. The last three years are seeing the birth of real recycling. And we're moving beyond the stages where we where we just pretended and we shipped it over to China and thought, oh, great, that's all recycled. Just wasn't right. And so infrastructure like the infrastructure that Mitch and I are building, we see that is going to be the way of the future. Quality, speed, and volume. And that's the key. So you'll have you know, nice homogeneous lumps of material in different parts of the, of the plant that you can actually uh, ship to a recycler and it goes back into a real product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, think that's nice. It feels like, you know, in the past, we're basically just like doing the cleaning before your in-laws come over, you know, yeah, half of yeah. it goes in the closet and you just pray nobody opens that up. Yeah. And now, oh my gosh, <laughs> I've opened the door. And no, 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 I'll hang your coat up. I'll hang it up. <laughs> Don't you look over there. Right. In there Lindsay. You just told me you just dropped yourself into your in-laws. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I love that that phrase, the conspiracy of silence. I mean, it just yeah. really is it really um paints a, a, a really clear picture. Um, no super nerdy question, already getting off topic, but with um, because I'm I'm just not sure about how this sorting works, but um when you're dealing with um, transmission curves with the spectroscopy, do you have mm. to sort first for color and then sort? For polymer or uh yeah well what what we used to do or what we do normally is you kick out the pet you so you want to separate first of all you separate them by polymer type so let's say um all the pet goes in one direction so it's constantly blowing it up or, or pushing it down whichever way it goes then you have a secondary sort that is by color so and pet the the main color is green um, HDPE, well, you go and look under your sink and you'll see every different colour of HDP or your shampoo bottles, this type of thing. So normally you separate by polymer type first and then by colour. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And but, with if you're dealing with if you're dealing with um, things like optical brightener and fluorescence, though, that can mess with the with the yes. transmission curve, though, right? And copolymers and homopolymers, you're exactly right. They are very challenging. But the technology, as I was saying, uh, Mitch and I were t discussing this only a couple of weeks ago, uh, the way the technology is going, being able to detect, you know, some of the multi-layer materials. Mm. I mean, there's two ways you can go about this. Let me say, there's, there's, you keep producing technology that is going to allow the marketing people to put anything they want on the market, right? And that, I think, is the wrong way to go. I'm a big, you know, manufacturer for recycling, design for recycling. Assume that this product has to get out of the mass market, of the consumer market, and then we have to find a way to get it back into the, into the valuable resource that it is. And so, uh, you know, I'm, like, for example, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time in the United Kingdom working with manufacturers to get them out of PVC bottles. You know, they were just so challenging and so damaging to the recycling system. So we, we you know, and, and don't get me wrong, PVC is a wonderful plastic, you know, in windows and, and you know, light sensitive issues, it's, it's sensational, but it doesn't need to be in a bottle. And so things like that, you, you look at where are the weaknesses, where are the low hanging fruit and how can we fix them and understanding why they're doing it. You know, uh, the argument, say, for a PVC bottle was because they could put a handle, you know, lower melt point, easy to easy to move the, the plastic, and they could create a handle. Whereas you notice with a PET bottle, you know, it doesn't really have a handle. It's a grip, that type of thing. So, you know, understanding why they do it and coming up with solutions, creative solutions that keep the marketing department happy, 
happy and keep the environmentalists uh, like ourselves happy. And I think that's a that's a, uh, a partnership that you know has seen some success, but obviously has uh, failed us in a lot of ways. We're hoping it takes off. Yeah. So I mean, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but right now, traditional recycling the percentage that actually gets recycled is very low, which is typically the first complaint that people yeah. have outside the industry that say, you don't recycle a lot of plastics as it is. Yeah. Why should we keep going that way? Infuriating. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. why is it such a low percentage when the actual recyclability, you know, besides the things you kind of mentioned with, you know, different colors or different, you know, polymers and all that, why is it actually, you know, so low when plastics itself is so recyclable. Yeah, very frustrating. Um, unfortunately, it's go it goes back to uh, the earlier issues. Where was the value? What was the, what was the low hanging fruit? And uh, and it was always seen to be P ones and twos, PET and HDPE. So we largely moved ourselves away from uh, the other plastics because we feared them. We feared the ability to sort, and we feared, and so that combined with what is occurring now, which is um, very low landfill costs, and therefore, and, and because China's gone, higher costs of sorting and this type of thing, they've thrown challenges out to the industry that have made a lot of the haulers actually walk away from recycling. You know, mm -hmm. basically, let's just put it in a landfill. And we, you know, I mean, the, the classic was, uh, you know, Cleveland, uh, reading an article, they had a report put out recently that said they're looking at actually charging households um, to have a recycling service. I mean, that's not what it's all about. So we've got some fundamental economic drivers that are failing us. And, uh, and until our leaders um, actually step in and say, hey, we've got to spill over cost of society here and this has got to be identified and it's got to be charged then we're not going to have the outcomes that we want. But I think that's an argument we can win over the longer term. And uh, we've just got to keep having that argument. And, and you know, yeah. I, I was really excited um, actually to see, you know, on, on the news section of, of your website, um, a partnership that you've recently been forming with um, with a company that that uh, it's an app, like almost like gamification for recycling. Yeah. I don't know if that was even on one of these questions, I mean, but could, could you talk a little bit about that? Because that's that's something you know, trying to trying to get um, um, municipal recycling started in places that that where it's not available. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about this this project? Yeah, so this we're incredibly excited about this. So one of the problems, again, going back to why we have such a low curry rate, you know, less than at least half of the country does not have access to curbside recycling. It's pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Either um, in some cases they're asked to to drive their material to um, to recycling depot or drop off point, um, and part of the reason and. And in addition, those that do have um, curbside programs, um, about 75% of folks actually participate in the recycling program. And of those, again, getting back to how confusing the current curbside rules are, is that you have only about a 40% hit rate of recycled materials of those participating who actually get in the recycle bin. So we kind of had the idea, we said, look, what there's this enormous um, kind of open stretch of America that, that doesn't have access to curbside recycling. And then if they do have that program, it's incredibly confusing. The haulers will say, okay, well, it can only put, you know, bottles with, with a, a neck top and a, and a thread in the, in the recycle bin, which is very common. You can't put, put this in, put that in. So as a result, people get frustrated. And what do people do when they're frustrated? They usually punt. So they'll take either, you know, all the plastic and they'll just say the heck with it, stuff's not gonna get recycled anyway, throw it in the trash. Or they'll take the reverse, which is the con contamination conundrum, which is wish cycling. And they take all the plastic and they say, well, I'll put it in all the recycling and somebody will figure it out and I'll get more stuff recycled. So both those cases, that's a big reason why we have such low recovery rates because it's a problem. And it's a problem for the, uh, for the curbside uh, haulers. So our idea was, look, you know, we have Uber, Uber has been invented. We can now, everybody with a smartphone can um, connect with somebody else with a smartphone 
phone who may want to just be a collector and maybe they're in a community and maybe they say, well, I want to help out. Um, I'd like to help collect plastic. So <clears throat> our new our new venture is called New Bin. Um, and it's actually, we're really um, at the ground floor of, of getting it set up and rolling it out. But it's really going to be a way of simplifying um, recycling pickup of recyclables. We want to pick up 100% of plastics. We want to have no sorting. We want you to just take your recycling bag or clear plastic bag, 30 gallon. If you have plastic post use, you throw it in the bag. You don't have to sort it. Of course, you rinse it first or throw out whatever you know leftover sandwich you have. Throw it in the bag. It doesn't matter if it's eyeglasses, a shopping bag, um, uh, an iPhone, or we actually don't want iPhones because you have the batteries inside, but um, and those are bad. But basically, not worry about it. You know the difference between paper and wood and glass and metal and plastic. And if it's plastic, you put it in the bag, you download your app, you hit a button, and then within a certain period of time, somebody from the community will come knock on your door. You can put it out of the curb or not put it out of the curb, wait till they get to the door and collect that bag. Then that bag will ultimately go to a local depot and that depot will aggregate that material. And that will then that ultimately will come to our, you know, 100% um, fully mechanized automated sorting. And this is really kind of the way that we need to go to kind of because the current, to say the current infrastructure collection infra isn't really set up for recycling. It's set up for hauling waste and dumping waste in landfills. And the first way that we're going to get to reverse that is by saying, let's, let's completely move away from manual sorting, having to figure out what's a one, what's a two, what's a five, what's good, what's bad. Get away from all that and just say, if it's plastic, we'll pick it up and we'll do all the sorting uh, for you. So we're hoping Erie will be our, our Love it. we're excited about Erie being our laboratory, our first uh, test case. And uh, we're going to be rolling, rolling it out at the beginning of next year. And, uh, and assuming it works, which we're totally confident it will, we'll, we'll roll it out from there. So we're in, that really, as much as kind of the, the IRG plant, the sorting concept itself, is really going to be revolutionary because this is really where we need to go for for collecting waste plastics and really driving recovery rates higher. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it that like Nubin is like the crowdsourcing or like crowd resourcing. <laughs> Absolutely. So so why Erie and and would this model work? Why did you choose Erie specifically? Because Mitch, you're you're from New York, right? I saw you went to to I, NYU and Fordham. And I, I'm from New York. Um, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say the Erie slogan is it's okay to love Erie. I just want to throw <laughs> that out there. Is it really? And we it really is. <laughs> joke when you came here, I said, that is like the least ambitious slogan I have ever heard in my life. So good. <laughs> Come on. You got to be proud. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah. The Midwest. I think it's very funny. Yeah. Um, so Erie, um, we, we were, uh, became interested in Erie because of Erie insurance. I mean, Erie insurance announced that they, um, had um, carved out a $50 million opportunity zone um, fund. They wanted to invest in some of the, you know, distressed areas, the opportunity zone distressed areas in Erie. And we were invited to kind of have a look at Erie. We were thinking about Ontario. We were thinking about other, in, we were thinking about Indiana. And then when Erie invited us in, we just, we started kind of, we brought around we met, we went to, um, we met with Ralph Ford at, at Penn State at Behrend. And he said, you know, do you know, do you realize we have the largest undergraduate re polymers research program in the country? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And also, do you know that you have this enormous downstream, you know, um, plastics extrusion infrastructure? These are your customers sitting right here. And then we are, are it really, Erie is really the bridge between the East Coast markets and, you know, and the Midwest cities. So, you know, within a 750 mile radius of Erie, I'm sure you know, is half of the population of the United States. And so when you when we think about kind of what's a great area for, you know, supply and feedstock, you know, it just made all the sense in the world. And then uh, basically Erie Insurance said, well, we're not going to let you out of this room unless you agree to build your plan. <laughs> so uh, like so here we are. We're, we're happy we made it. <laughs> And everybody in the town 
has been oh. absolutely welcoming, incredibly. Uh, we, we couldn't have uh, asked for a better welcome and everybody's been super great, super supportive. And I will say, um, if you play your cards right, you can get uh, drunk for $20 or less every night of the week at a different bar. Just might be from experience, it might not be. I don't know. But it's all. We've already started exploring those avenues. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for those listening, you know, IRGs are going to be considered a super PR app. Can yeah. you explain what that is? Plastics recovery facility is well, what it's all about is it's about what it says it's recovering all the plastics but it's fundamentally this this term perf has developed as a result of um, the industry getting frustrated with the lack of quality coming into recycling plants so i'm sitting there as a recycler and uh and i'm buying from the waste companies who are sorting and they're motivated to give me the lowest quality they can so that I have to landfill it and not them. So this issue has been going on. There's been this battle between the waste industry mm. and, um, and downstream real recyclers. It's been going on since Adam was a boy. And uh, the, the, the issue has been that, that they're financially motivated. So, so the evolution of the Perth is all about saying, hey, I'm, a ma I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. So we are getting on the front foot and saying we are going to sort this material out. We are going to create the homogeneous uh, bales of material and we are going to take responsibility for it. And, uh, and so it's using all the technology and at our, uh, at our uh, feet to be able to ensure that we produce good quality material. That's what a plastics recovery facility is. And I would, al I would also add to that, we call it super because you need a certain scope and scale. Um, you know, recycling at the end of the day, it's a it's a scale business. Um, you need to have scale to drive down the cost of, of uh, capital spending and operating costs per ton of material. Not a lot of people understand that. Or if they do, they don't know where to get the materials. So, um, so we, we call it a super perf. And then the other key is having a home um, for everything that comes to the door. That is, absolutely essential because a super perf or any perf doesn't work if, you know, as Chris, you know, alluded to, if 20, 30, 40% of the material you're getting is waste, and then what do you do with it? You have to go to a landfill and by landfilling it, you're paying very high tipping fees. And it's because of that, that a traditional perf as we've seen it, you know, up to today, really it doesn't work because the, the, the land, the um, yield loss just, just kills you. So we kind of are going to that next step. We're saying, we think we've got the cure. And the cure is that, you know, now again, over the past five years with, with different avenues, um, chemical recyclers, advanced recyclers, there, there are now um, outlets for the quote unquote non-recycled plastics where you won't lose money. But, you know, our... We, we kind of call our business, it's a bridge, right? A bridge is we, we, we want to create highest and best use for all recycled materials. And that means mechanical recycling of everything that can come in and really bottle to bottle or product to product kind of close loop. That is the ultimate goal. But you can't even take the next step to get there unless you have a way to drive all resins in very high volumes through one campus. And once you have that campus, you can say, hey, uh, Nestle's or Frito-Lay, I've got low density polyethylene. We've got film. We've got 10,000 tons of it. We've got 20,000 tons of it. You know, can you do something with this? And we go back to the problem. It's really a chicken and egg. The chicken and the egg situation is, you know, you don't have a lot of broad markets for different resins because nobody's collecting it. The haulers aren't the holders aren't collecting it because they don't have anybody to sell it to. They, they're not going to invest in ear and thread machines to sort out materials unless they know that there's a ready market, very large ready market for that. So how do we bridge this chicken and egg? And so the interim step is, you know, some of this material is probably going to be downcycled. Some of it may go to chemical recycling. Some of it may be converted to it, it, at the worst case, it will be concerned, concerned uh, to repurpose to alternative fuel, which is at least better than landfill. 
But ultimately it's a bridge. It's how do we get from here to there, to there being, you know, 95% of, of resins have mechanical recycling applications. And we think we'll get there in, you know, 10 years, five, 10 years, we, we will be there, but we have to be that bridge to get to that, to get to that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and certainly to keep up with some of these commitments that that some of these these large companies have made, um, yes. even over the past year um, or two years, you know, um, it seems like there will be a market for it. You also see companies like um, I think Lego released the other day, right, yeah. um, with the yeah. PET you know uh, blocks that they're they're right. uh, testing. Um, so that's that's really exciting as well. Um, but creating a market out of out of thin air. So, uh, you know, Mitch, what was your, cause, cause you don't come from a technical background. You come from finance. Isn't that correct? Yep. Yeah. So I actually, I came from the steel industry and I kind of got into this by the, the back door. So I was a CFO of a steel company and we were always looking for ways um, both to improve our sustainability of the steel company and also to lower our energy costs. So I just kind of stumbled upon this, um, this, it was really kind of a web article about how the Japanese um, and the, and we later learned the Europeans, um, the Germans and the Austrians as part of their um, environmental program were avoiding landfill of non-recyclable waste plastics by injecting them into the blast furnace of steel mills. And the reason that they, um, they landed on uh, the blast furnace of steel mills kind of the ideal vessel for eliminating this plastic um, was because in a blast furnace, if you look at the environment, it's a extremely high temperature, 2000 degrees centigrade at the heel and a zero oxygen, uh, a zero oxygen environment. So in that environment, what they saw and that's been proven for decades now through, through their emissions testing and, and their environmental um, regulatory apparatus, um, dioxins, furons, these, it's essentially a gasification it's as if we were doing pyrolysis and you were gasifying, um, but, but the blast furnace was already a billion dollar piece of equipment that was essentially ready-made. So you didn't have to go out and build all new equipment and build gasifiers. So it was just kind of a ready-made converter. And so I looked at that and I said, well, that's actually pretty cool. Um, okay, I understand they are just trying to get rid of waste plastic. What if I actually could make an alternative fuel that was clean, that was calorifically consistent, and um, that would could actually replace metallurgical coal. And you know, and because plastic is a hydrocarbon, you actually reduce CO2 emissions for every ton of metallurgical coal because coal is a pure carbon, um, and you get a hydrogen pickup. So you're actually you're you're um, creating more energy, and you're using it as an iron reducing agent um, with lower uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and you're obviously replacing a virgin, one of the dirtiest of the fossil fuels there is, and that's coal, with a material that's already been manufactured for something else and would otherwise go into landfill. And so that's when I just kind of noodle, started noodling on the idea. And I eventually started talking to my friends in the steel industry and bless this guy, like, wow, that's incredible. If you can make that material and it can replace coal, like we'll buy every pound of it that, that you can make. And so, you know, it started with, hey, that's great. But then when we got talking to the engineers and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second, <laughs> yeah, this really works. So that, it, you know, and the steel industry is like the most conservative steel industry, most conservative industry you can think of. They're like the last adopters of technology. But anyway, that started a long journey of kind of convincing the steel industry that, um, that for our material, that's really our byproduct. You know, all the stuff that we can't mine and can't pull out for mechanical recyclers, the really the waste that's that's going to be basically thrown into landfill. You know, at least it can go into a preferable use, which is to reduce coal usage and reduce greenhouse gases in um, in uh, steel. And then that got me on kind of my whole journey of hey. Let's not just let's not make a an alternative fuel. Let's actually figure out how we can make this incredibly large scale uh, sorting plant where we can get into the mining business, and, and that that mining is mining for good recyclable materials. That's kind of that was kind of my background. So it's been a long journey, and and uh, 
it's been it's just been a passion of uh, a labor of love and uh, and a passion for me. So I've, I've loved every uh, every minute of it. So how long ago did that start? When this when that that first you know thought you know well, sparked? My question is, who wrote that article? Do you know? Because I feel like you owe them like a gift basket or something. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was actually it was a, a Japanese. It was a report published by a Japanese steel company called NKK, which was the largest Japanese steel producer at the time. And now it's it's called JFE, but it's still the largest Japanese steel company. They're still injecting plastic and they're still recycling. It's a very much a vertically integrated uh, model. So they take um, they take waste plastic from communities around um, around their blast furnaces, and you know they're doing it. They've been doing it for decades now. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, 2007, and then that was when I started knocking on doors of steel guys. It took me from 2007 two years just to get an MOU with the steel guys after they said, whoa, we're really excited about this. And then it took to go through all the legalities, two years, and then another, I wanna say three years to go through R&D with them and convince their engineers that it was worth doing and going through all the traps and, and um, to get them to say, yeah, this works. This is gonna work, it's great, and let's do it. And, um, so, so again, that was just kind of one leg of kind of the three-legged stool. Once we had an outlet um, for, and now since that time, obviously we have other outlets. We have the bright marks of the world and the pure cycles and the loops. People, folks who are saying we can take non-recyclable plastic and we can convert them or repurpose them into waxes or oils um, or back into monomers and, and chemical recycling. So all of that is really exciting because it kind of underpins our model, which is that you know, we're agnostic as to, you know, whoever can come along and take our material for its highest and best use, you will get our material. Our job is to attack the collection system. How do we get more material out of homes and, and get that material sorted into the right, into the right direction? I love it. Um, and the facility in Erie, that is scheduled to be completed by the end of 2022. Is that what I was reading? Uh, 23. 23. Yeah. So it's about like, a, it's like an 18 month um, build out. We kind of hope to break ground at the beginning of uh, next year. So. I will, I'll be circling around, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll come for a visit, Lindsay, then, yeah. and, and then and check it out. peering up above. It'll be very <laughs> impressive, girls, I can guarantee you. <laughs> Yeah, we're really excited. Um, well, Chris, I know you have a flight to catch um, in a few minutes, so we want to be respectful of that time. Yeah, for those of you who are just listening and not not watching, um, Chris is actually at at the airport um, in uh, in Copenhagen right now, so we're seeing some some, uh, some cars and, and planes going by in the background here. <laughs> That's right. They come in and out. Yeah. So anyway, it seems to work. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so we appreciate you guys coming on here um, and, you know, maybe, um, maybe once the facility's up and running, we could do like a follow-up or something like that, see how things are going or, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Come um, and visit. We'll do the tour. And look, look for our um, coming crowdfunding okay. uh, Fandango for, uh, for Nubin. So Nubin is going to be a totally separately financed and operating company. And it's going to be kind of the front end of our RG plan. So it's a little bit tough to, to come on board and be a part of an industrial plan. Um, but we're, we're going to be creating Nubin as a kind of community, a large community, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. And we hope that everybody who's interested in recycling and interested in environmentalism comes in and becomes a part of, uh, of Nubin. So Awesome. That was completely a plug. I hope you don't mind if, if uh, you're <laughs> all for the plug. Yeah, no. So where so where will we be able to, to follow the Nubin news? Yeah, so we're um, we are. I think we're starting up an Instagram and Twitter. We're going to have all the social media. Um, but if you go to if you become part of IRG's social media platform, um, we'll be announcing all of our um, Nubin developments. And it's really going to start happening here over the next kind of two to three months. Okay. So, and we can, um, we can link up in the show notes. I actually don't know if we put anything in our show notes. That feels like, uh, we can post it on our socials. <laughs> we can post it on our social, uh, if we don't have show notes, I, 
Um, and, you know, so anyone interested can follow us if they're, you know, to get to you guys or, yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, guys.